Hello everyone and welcome back to the Great Book of Grudges, my name is Nathan and we're back with another Total War Warhammer video. Today we're going to continue our missing character series with a possible pre-order DLC incentive character. This character is Nagash, the Supreme Lord of the Undead, where we'll discuss his lore, his rules on the tabletop, and how he could be implemented into Total War Warhammer. So without further ado, let's begin. To better introduce this character to those who might not be aware of him, we'll read over his entry in the Warhammer Fantasy Battles 8th edition supplement of the End Times known as the Book of Nagash. Nagash, Supreme Lord of the Undead. Nagash began his mortal life some four and a half thousand years ago. He was born in Kemri, most prominent of the cities of Nehekara the most civilized realm of mankind. As the firstborn son of King Ketep, tradition demanded that Nagash join the priesthood. The kingship would pass to his younger brother, Futep, a fate deemed intolerable to Nagash. He felt that the inheritance of rule should be his and his alone. Nagash seethed at the indignity, but kept the growing hatred within his heart, throwing himself Tirelessly into his studies, Nagash began a quest for magical lore that has never ceased. At that time, the death-obsessed mortuary priests of Nehekara had unlocked many secrets of extended life, and Nagash mastered every ritual, uncovered every secret. He was never satisfied, and soon his experiments pushed the boundaries far beyond magical embalming. Nagash sought some new insight into the arcane, and fate in the form of Dark Elf captives provided it. Nagash extracted the secrets of dark magic by tormenting the elves. With this newfound knowledge, he created an elixir from human blood that prolonged life. Atop his foundational knowledge of death and arcane immortality, Nagash now blended something new and dreadful. This was the birth of necromancy, and it gave him a new dominion, the ability to animate the dead and bind the spirits to his will. With this power, Nagash grew bolder. Nagash slew his brother, claiming the throne of Kemri. His ambition unchecked, Nagash sought to subjugate all of Nehekara. To fuel his boundless schemes, Nagash began to build the Black Pyramid. Each of Nehekara's great cities was coerced into sending tribute, long lines of enforced labor to aid in its construction. Unprecedented in the history of mankind, the Black Pyramid was a monstrous edifice, larger than any structure before or since. The cost was staggering, not just in labor and materials, but also in blood and souls. It was not only a sign of Nagash's overwhelming pride, as everyone thought. It was also designed to attract the winds of dark magic, storing them for Nagash's use. Not since the great rule of Setra had Nehekara been so united. However, the nation burned beneath Nagash's cruel tyranny. This, combined with Nagash's disregard for the gods, caused the lesser cities to rise up in revolt. Nagash raised undead armies for the first time, but was ultimately defeated in a series of brutal wars. He only managed to escape Kemri through trickery and the sacrifice of his most loyal follower, Arkan the Black. All that Nagash had wrought during his 50-year reign was raised, yet nine tomes, the sum total of all Nagash's learnings were not destroyed, but secretly spirited out of Kemri. Before long, necromancy would surface in the city of Lemire in a new and horrible fashion. Presumed dead, Nagash wandered long in the desert, vowing a mighty revenge. It was in this period that Nagash founded his mountain stronghold of Nagashizar the huge fortress built into Cripple Peak. He also consumed Warpstone for the first time, changing him irrevocably. 
Nagash's frame grew large and his skin withered and cracked before slowing away from his bones. His heart stopped, but driven by his dark will, Nagash became more powerful than ever. His mind was opened up to a new and deeper understanding of dark magic. Nagash was something more than human now, and the tribes of men who lived near Cripple Peak began to worship him as a god. This greatly pleased Nagash, and he taught them the ritual of the Dark Feast. Although twisted and degenerate, their foul descendants remain avid worshippers of the necromancer to this day. After long wars with the Skaven over control of warpstone deposits, Nagash was reunited with the first of the vampires. They became champions for Nagash's armies as he attempted to take over Nehekara, but once again he underestimated his former countrymen. It was a long and destructive campaign, but King Alcadizar had the upper hand. The greatest general since Setra, he broke the undead armies and the vampires fled. Nagash cursing them so that forever they burned beneath the light of the sun. His monstrous pride wounded. Nagash concocted the most terrible of plagues and unleashed it upon Nehekara, wasting everything, crops, cattle and people. One by one, al watched his friends and family die, but he himself was spared, as if some malign power willed it. And so it did, for into this barren wasteland marched the undead upon Nagash's command. They captured the king and brought him in chains to Nagash's R. Nagash wanted a living witness to see his great ritual a spell that would reanimate every dead body in Nehekara, enslaving them all beneath Nagash's indomitable will. A final torment for the man who dared defy him. In order to rule the nation once more, Nagash had turned Nehekara into the land of the dead. The great ritual was successful, and one of the largest armies the world had ever seen rose up and marched to do his bidding. Flushed with power and reveling in his revenge, Nagash let down his guard while he recovered from that awesome feat of magic. Skaven assassins freed al and equipped him with the Fell Blade, a warpstone-infused sword. Thus was Nagash hacked apart and cast into oblivion for a time, his artifacts stolen and scattered across the world. It took many years for Nagash's form to coalesce within his Black Pyramid. Once more, he attempted to take over Nehekara and again was defeated, cast from the lands by Setra himself. Heading to Nagash's R once again, Nagash destroyed the Skaven he found there, raging to discover the Warpstone all but mined out. He labored long to create his sword, Sethepneptar and the armor, Morikane. Piecing together the whereabouts of his missing crown and staff, he was led north to the Empire. There, Nagash fought Sigmar and his dwarf allies to a standstill, but with his powers strained to the limit, Nagash fell victim to a blow from Gal Maraz. For generations, Nagash was little more than a whisper on the wind of Shaish. Slowly, he regained the ability to contact and manipulate his most loyal servants. Always, he steered them towards his reawakening. Nagash vowed to bide his time, not returning until his powers were regained in full, until he was ready to reign supreme. He envisioned the world filled with undead, a realm fully beneath his control. However, the portents were troubled. The Dark Gods were moving, and Nagash realized unless he returned to thwart them, chaos would conquer all. This time, the great necromancer was going to claim the power of death itself. He would choke all life from the world and rule eternally in the darkness that followed. This was of course a brief overview of his lore. I don't want to go over everything because then this video would end up being like 4 hours long. 
So this is more or less enough to introduce the character to people. With all that being said, Nagash had a model and rules and so on prior to the one that you can see on screen. However, it makes most sense for him to be implemented in his end times form, considering that other characters such as Ark and the Black are using their end times looks. With that, we'll look over his stats and rules on the tabletop. Stat-wise, he was quite powerful, which is what you can expect from a god-tier character. Very high stats all around, with nothing really too low. He was incredibly expensive to bring on the tabletop too, considering that he was a thousand points, which in standard games there means he would cost half of your army total. In regards to his battlefield role, Nagash was really a melee caster hybrid, but he was immensely powerful at both. His special items and high stat values would assure that he'd be able to do a lot of damage, but also cast a lot of spells at the same time. He had access to the Law of Death, the Law of Light, the Law of Nehekara, and the Law of Vampires. These are all established already in Total War Warhammer, but he also had access to a fifth and final law, the Law of Undeath, which was implemented in the end times. We'll have a video soon enough going into deep detail regarding that spell law itself. Now, seeing as he had five different laws on the tabletop, it could be assumed that he could have access to all five laws. It's also very possible we might see him with one or two spells per law, but given that this is Nagash, I think he should have access to all five. Perhaps an interesting way to go about all the skill points here would be as you unlock one spell for one law, you would then unlock another spell from the other laws. So as soon as you get one, you get access to four others. Yes, this does sound a bit overpowered, I can even say that too. But remember that this again is a god tier character and the god tier characters tend to be a bit stronger than usual. Even more so, I'm assuming, if it's a god itself, because he does eventually become a god of death. By devouring the others, but that's more of a lore discussion for the future. Of course, he also had a plethora of special rules and magical items. Let's start by looking at his special rules. The first was Arch Necromancer, where he could re-roll a miscast, but be forced to accept the second result. Of course, miscasts work rather differently in Total War Warhammer, where I'm assuming this would just be a baseline trait which would lower the chances of him to miscast. The second rule was Death Magic Incarnate. Nagash and all friendly units with the undead special rule within 12 inches of him suffer two wounds fewer than they would normally do due to the unstable special rule. Basically what this meant is it would reduce the amount of crumbling that the undead would suffer on the tabletop. I'm not sure if that could be implemented in any way, shape or form in Total War Warhammer. Or if Nagash would have some sort of leadership aura which would make any undead near him unbreakable. But even I think that sounds a tad too overpowered. The last special rule is Supreme Lord of the Undead. When Nagash successfully casts a summoning spell from the Law of Undeath, triple the points worth of models that he can summon. This is a bit tougher because the Law of Undeath focused around summoning, like really, really heavily. I'm assuming that it would also do the same if implemented in Total War Warhammer. As you upgraded the spell, you could summon more. I'm assuming that Nagash using these spells would not need to overcast them to get them at its most powerful. The basic spell will summon its most powerful units as it could. This of course makes sense for Nagash. Now we can move on to the magical items. The first being Alakanash, the Staff of Power. This staff essentially allowed him to store up Winds of Magic and you could use them in a later turn. In an easy enough way to translate it, you could essentially just have the staff give him extra Winds of Magic as a starting point in every battle. Possibly an extra 10 to 15. That seems fair enough for a god tier character. Morricane the Black Armor was magical armor which increased his armor save value and also gave him a ward save. That's easy enough to translate. 
His other items, the Nine Books of Nagash, was what allowed him to have other spells, where he could generate a total of 8 spells alongside his baseline spell known as Rise. We've already discussed this really, where, where instead of just having 9 spells, which seems a bit anticlimactic for the Lord of Undeath, I believe he should just have access to all 4 laws, and obviously his baseline special law. And lastly, we've got Sefet Neptar, the Mortis Blade, a magical weapon which made him stronger in close combat. Easy enough to translate, really. As soon as he gets it, he'll just be more powerful in close combat, and it could be a bit of a problem if he's not taken care of. But that's pretty much everything. Now we'll be moving on to how he could be implemented into Total War Warhammer. This is a bit of a tricky one. You see, if the Vampire Counts are the last DLC, then maybe he could be the pre-order incentive, as you can see from the title of my video. Many people have taken to assuming that the next DLC might be the last, which to me makes a lot of sense. It's been a while since we've heard anything on Warhammer 3, and it can be assumed that we're getting closer and closer. If Game 3 will be utter chaos, as Creative Assembly have stated in the past, perhaps it might be a good idea to implement Nagash now. If he's the pre-order incentive for Total War Warhammer 3, and he'll only be available in the Mortal Empires campaign, until of course the big Mortal Empires-esque map for Warhammer 3, well, this could kickstart the whole end time scenario. It can be assumed that the big mega Mortal Empires map would not be available at launch, so if we have him now, it's kinda like the theme as Nagash is starting to raise in power. He is completely aware that the Dark Gods are also stirring their forces, so he's starting to act as stated in the lore. If Creative Assembly are moving towards an end times route for Game 3, well, this would probably be the best way to start hyping everyone up for it. I understand the end times are a sore subject for many, believe me it still is for me, but it does make sense if this is the third and final game of the series that the big Mortal Empires map would have some sort of end times storyline, where you can choose to end the world or try and save it. It kind of fits. Yes, I know the end times was horrible writing and so on, but this is in more of a sandbox mode because that's how Total War Warhammer works. With Nagash's implementation, this would also be the introduction of a true hybrid faction, the Legions of Undead, which would be a true mix of vampire counts and also tomb kings. Possibly even Vampire Coast 2, as that was established in lore. Regarding faction mechanics, this could be a way for Creative Assembly to do something really special. Nagash, at the start of the end times, is obviously quite weak, and eventually he does end up bending various different undead forces to his will. This could be implemented in a form of a locked mechanic where early on, Nagash would only have access to a small roster of units, but as he defeats Tomb King Lords, he would force confederate them, obviously excluding Cetra, and get access to more and more units. The same could also be said for the Vampire Counts and the Vampire Coast. Meaning that if you want access to anything in particular, well, this might be the best way to go about it. A mechanic such as this would make the player actually move around and try and search out for different lords and heroes. Nagash to me seems like the best choice to see the end of Warhammer 2. Who better to see the death of a game as we move on to the third and final game of the trilogy than the Supreme Lord of the Undead himself? These are just some ideas, but let me know what you guys think. Honestly, it just seems like it kind of fits. But let me know what you guys think in the comments below, and let's start a bit of a discussion. But with that, my friends, we've come to the end of our video. Thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy the video, might I suggest giving the video a like, or even subscribing to the channel, as it really does help us out. In the description section below are various links to different social media platforms, such as Facebook, Instagram, and Discord. Also in the description section is an affiliate link with Element Games where you could buy loads of hobby based products, not just Warhammer, for 10 to 25% off. Making a purchase using that link and also our special code, which is also in the description, supports the channel at no extra cost to you, which we think is rather cool. 
A big thank you to our patrons. Your support means the world to us. It's amazing that people want to help a small channel like us grow and get to a higher level of content. A big thank you to Gibraltar LUSC, Ryan Birch, Andrew Prince, and Okro for subscribing to us at our fame level. You guys are super cool. And a big thank you to Edward Yule, VS Fasan, Aaron Whitman, and Shaggy for subscribing to us at our king level. Honestly, we can't thank you all enough. And lastly, a big thank you to all of you for liking, sharing, and commenting on these videos. Honestly, it's because of you guys that the channel's been growing at such a great pace lately, so we can't thank you all enough. But with that, my friends, thank you so much for watching once again, and we shall see you all again very, very soon. Have a good day.